Well, today we're starting this new series in Acts chapter 2. Uh, we recently went through Acts chapter 1, and today is starting in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of the church. And uh, as we talk about the beginning of the church, we're talking about the beginning of the first church, all right? Not, not the first Baptist church of some particular town or the first church of whereverville. We're talking about the first church, the first ever church. And uh, it takes place in Acts chapter 2 in the city of Jerusalem where things get started. And so we're going to dive into this. Uh, I'm going to forewarn you this morning. we got a lot to get through, so you got to stick with me here. We're going to move fast and, uh, and dive into a lot, of, a, a lot of different things as we're into Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2, it's on page 530. If you're using the Bibles under the chairs around you, I want to encourage you to turn there. And this morning we're going to be looking at the first 13 uh, verses of that chapter. Now, to help kind of set the tone for us, uh, if you weren't with us, um, you, you need to remember some things or you need to know some things that happened um, in chapter 1. In Acts 1, we saw the apostles uh, select the new apostle, right, to replace Judas Iscariot. Uh, and they were committed to prayer. We saw that in verses 12 through 14. And then we also saw probably most importantly is going back to the beginning of the book of Acts in chapter 1 and, and verse 8 is the final words that we have of Jesus uh, recorded here as Luke gives it to us in, in Acts 1.8. And it says this, But you will receive power, this is Jesus speaking, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, that description of what Jesus talks about there in Acts 1-8 is about to happen now in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, all right? So what he talked about there, you're going to be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem and going through the whole earth. That's what he's going to talk about, and that's what we're going to see in Acts chapter 2. By the way, Dave and Dee and family, it is great to see you guys here this morning. Glad to have you guys back with us today. Um, visiting from out of town, so we're glad to have you guys here. Good to see you. Um, as we dive into this, though, I want to just take a moment and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Just commit our time to Him before we dive into Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. God, we come before You today. We just commit this time to You. Lord, we thank You for, uh, Lord, really the, the historical account that we have given in here in Acts of how the church was started. We ask and pray, Lord, that You would just guide and direct us, that we would le lean into Your Word, and that we would learn from it today. Uh, Lord, that we would see what, what took place and that we would grow uh, deeper in our love and our knowledge and understanding of you and your word than in our passion to follow you. Lord, we love you. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to walk through this with you, starting back in verse 1 there, when the day of Pentecost arrived. It's the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. It was the 50th day um, since the Passover, since the Feast of the Passover, since Jesus was crucified. And the word Pentecost is the New Testament name for the Old Testament festival called the Feast of, of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest, all right? And, and you need to understand this. Three times a year, Jews were required to come to the city of Jerusalem to the temple to offer sacrifices there. And if you were a devout Jew, it didn't matter where you lived in the known world, you were going to make it to Jerusalem. You were going to find a way to be there. And so I want you to think about that, right? Because the last time that they were to gather in the city of Jerusalem was for the Passover. And so you had this huge crowd that was in the, there for the Passover and probably many witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they probably were like, hey, remember last time we were here? All that was going on around Passover and they crucified the, that guy that claimed to be the Son of God. You, you, you know, it's just good to kind of think through what might have been taking place. And it's very possible that some of those same individuals have come back now 50 days later and they're in the city of Jerusalem, and they're about to experience another incredible event called the Day of Pentecost. And maybe, maybe just some of those individuals, and this is entirely speculation, but maybe some of the individuals that shouted crucify him are some who would be among 3,000 who had come to faith in Jesus Christ on that first day of the church. 
Interesting to think about it in that light. Well, Jesus had told them to uh, day of Pentecost, uh, they were all together in one place. They were supposed to stay in the upper room. Verse 2 says, And there came from heaven a sound like a, a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Jesus had told them, right, that the Holy Spirit would come. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says this, And while staying with them in... This is going to help me out a whole lot more if I wear these. And while staying with them, that's a whole lot clearer, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, right? Stay here. Stay in the upper room. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, the words of Jesus, for John baptized you with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. All right? And so he told them, Holy Spirit's coming. And once again, it's just a reminder that word baptize means to immerse. I think that's interesting to note because in verse 2 it says that when this mighty rushing wind sound comes, it, it fills the entire house, right? Fills the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. If you look back in verse 2, the word suddenly and suddenly there came from him. Obviously, it was something that grabbed everybody's attention, even though they were waiting for it, even though they knew it was a matter of time before the Holy Spirit was coming, they were in shock and awe. And if we were to describe this event, we might describe it as like a freight train. All right? It says here it, it, was, it was the sound of, of a mighty rushing wind, or we could even use the word violent, a violent wind. I, in my mind, I go to a sound, you know, like you might think of like a torna tornado or a hurricane. And a lot of times they describe those as like a sound like a freight train was coming through the house, right? That's kind of the idea. It's a mighty rushing of violent wind noise, okay? They're just describing the noise that they heard. It's important to note it wasn't literal fire, all right? As noted by the words as and of, but take note that it rested on each one of them. That's really important, okay? Really important. Listen to what MacArthur says. That the tongues rested on each one of them shows that all who were present received the Spirit in that moment. It was a uniform, sovereign work of God on all collectively, not something sought individually. At this point, by the baptism with the Spirit, they were all made into one spiritual body, the body of Christ, and we could say also known as the church. And that's where the church is started here in Acts chapter 2. Well, Looking back at verse 4, it, it says this in verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the baptism of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. Um, we mentioned a, a few weeks back in chapter 1 as we looked at verses 4 through 6 there. We said this, the baptism of the Spirit is the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell within the life of a believer at the point of salvation placing them in the universal church, okay? Placing them into the body of Christ. So the baptism of the Spirit takes place at the moment of salvation, all right? And we emphasize that back in chapter 1, verse 4. And we also said when we talked about that, that it's not something you can do, it's something you receive. You, you can't do it, it's similar to salvation. You can't earn salvation. It's not of work so that no one can boast, Right? It's not something you can do. It's something you receive. And at the moment of salvation, God's Spirit comes and dwells in the life of a believer. Now, being filled with the Spirit is different. It's not something that happens all the time. But take note here, in Acts 2, all were filled with the Holy Spirit in this group, including Peter. But take note, in Acts 4, verse 8, Peter is again filled with the Spirit. That tells us what? That he wasn't filled the whole time. The filling of the Spirit comes and goes. Acts chapter 6, Stephen is described as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Yet later in Acts 7.55, Stephen is again filled with the Spirit. So it's not something, the filling of the Spirit isn't something that happens all the time. All right? I just want you to catch that. Um, and yet we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Paul told us this in, in Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with, you want to be drunk with something, be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, right? 
MacArthur explains that verse by saying this, the grammatical construction of that passage indicates believers are to be continuously being filled with the Spirit. You catch that? Listen to that again. It indicates believers are to be continuously being filled, right? It's like, it's like you're at the gas pump and you're constantly filling the vehicle with gas, right? It's constantly coming in. We're to be continuously being filled with the Spirit. Those who would be filled with the Spirit must first empty themselves. Get out of the way, right? Get out of the way. Get our, rid of ourselves. Die to self, right? That involves confession of sin and dying to selfishness and self-will. To be filled with the Spirit is to consciously practice the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and to have a mind saturated with the Word of God. And I think we would all admit, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, that we're not always filled with the Spirit. And if you think you probably are, the person who's sitting next to you could probably tell you a moment when you weren't, okay? All right? We won't go there, all right? We'll just ask them later, all right? So you need to understand there's a difference there. So looking back at Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says they were all filled with the Spirit, the whole group, right? And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're going to talk about this second part of verse 4. And if you're wondering, we're going to talk a lot about speaking in tongues this morning. All right, I want to work through the text here through verse 13. And then I'm going to come back and I want to talk about this idea of speaking in tongues um, in, in a little more detail. Um, some would like to take this passage and they would like to use it to back the belief uh, of speaking in tongues as the charismatic or Pentecostal church would like to make it look like today. But quite honestly, it's not in the text. All right. In fact, this text is not ambiguous. It's crystal clear. And I want to take you back to what we talked about at the beginning of this year. We were in a series called Twisted Truths. And in that series, we talked about the importance of knowing how to study the Bible, right? And as we talked about that in this idea of the text here, the, the speaking in tongues in Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost was they were speaking known languages. And we're going to walk through this and explain it to you. And I want you to just know, it's really pretty simple. You need to remember this. As you study God's Word and interpret the Bible, there's only one interpretation of each text, okay? There can be multiple ways you can apply that text, but there's only one interpretation. The interpretation of Acts 2 is very simple. It's very clear. Let's walk through it, all right? Um, as you look at verse 4 there, it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Your Bible might have a footnote next to that word tongues, and maybe you look at the bottom of the page, and it, and it might even tell you this, the word for tongues is also the word languages, all right? Um, therefore, even as you read the text, if you insert the word languages, when you see the word tongues, it makes sense as you read it, right? Let's do that, right? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, one of the other things we talked about in that series, Twisted Truths, was the importance of allowing the context of what's taking place in that whole passage to explain some different things, right? To explain the whole text. That's what happens here. Take a look at verse 5. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why? Because they were there for the feast. They were there for the day of Pentecost. They were all gathered in Jerusalem. And at this sound, that sound that was a mighty rushing wind, a violent noise, right? The multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. That's where that word language helps clarify some things once again, right? So if you read through that, it's really clear. The Spirit comes upon them, gives them this incredible ability, this miraculous ability, and I don't use that word miracle lightly, um, this miraculous ability to speak in other languages as the Spirit gives them utterance. And now you get all these people that have gathered in Jerusalem. They hear this noise that sounds like a, a tornado's going through, and they all gather. Of course they did. If there was a huge noise, we'd be like, what was that? And everybody wants to know. And they gather around this area, and you have this 
group of people coming together, and this multitude hears this noise, and now they're hearing individuals speaking in their different languages. Now, it says they were bewildered there in verse 6. Why were they bewildered? Well, verse 7 tells us, because they were Galileans. Verse 7 says this, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Like, didn't all these people graduate from Pioneer? I can say that I went to Pioneer. I mean, that was kind of a joke when I was in school, right? But uh, that, that's kind of that idea. Like, Galileans weren't the most educated individuals, okay? They, now, I say that they were able to speak multiple languages, most of them, all right? But they weren't the most educated individuals. And you got this group of people from all over the known world. They've gathered in one city, and this group of people come out, and they're speaking in all these different languages. Listen as it continues. Verse 8, how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. I can tell you, it took me a long time practicing that to get all those right. We hear them telling, verse 11, in our own, let's insert the word languages, right? The mighty works of God. And so you got this group of people that have gathered. Think back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We started with that this morning for a reason, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. That's what's happening right there, right at that moment. They're gathered together. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they're able to speak the truth of the Word of God, the mighty works of God, to all of these individuals that have gathered there for this feast. And not only are they sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ right there in Jerusalem with all these people that are about to go back to their homes, go back to where they're from. So take a minute and, and look at this map here on the screen, will you? kind of gives you an idea of where all these individuals were from. All over the Mediterranean, all over uh, the, the Middle East there, they were from all over. And, and when you think about these, uh, these different individuals and all these different languages that were being spoken, the gospel was heard in a mighty way. And I, I'm not trying to jump ahead, but I want you to hear how the story ends. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says this. So those who received his word, talking about Peter. Peter's about to preach a message. We'll start diving into that next week. But those who received his word were and were baptized, there was added that day about 3,000 souls. Church goes from 120 to 3,120 in a day. Think about that for a minute. It was an amazing event. It was an incredible event. But 3,000 people get saved and now they go back, not just to their homes right in Jerusalem, but all over. And the gospel is spread. Acts 1-8 is being played out already in chapter 2 from day 1 as the church gets started. Think about a missions program there, a mission strategy there, right? I think God had a pretty awesome plan. Notice there at the end of verse 11, it says, the, the, the crowd there said, we hear them telling in our own tongues, our own languages, the mighty works of God. That's what was speaking, that, that's what speaking in tongues was, was about in the book of Acts. Okay? You need to catch that. When you hear that phrase speaking in tongues, you need to think in your mind, speaking the gospel in a language that the hearer can understand. All right? And this text is really clear. Makes it very clear, makes it very obvious. They come out and they're able to speak the gospel in all of these different languages. Verse 12 says this, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they're filled with wine, and Peter's going to address that really clearly, like, hello, it's first thing in the morning, we're not drunk. The reality is you're hearing the gospel in your own language for the first time. And he's going to make it really clear as he talks about it. He's like, this Jesus that you crucified. Remember last time you were in town? You crucified him. Listen, he's the answer. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. 3,000 people are going to get saved in that one day. So let's look at some observations we can make 
from what we see here in Acts 2 regarding speaking in tongues. First of all, number one, they were real languages. All right? Some simple observations. They were real languages. Verse 8 and 9, 10, they mapped that out so clearly. 11 says very clearly they were able to hear it in their own language and they list the different groups, people groups that were there. Number two, the miraculous nature of it was undeniable by most. Yeah, there's a few saying they're drunk, but for the most part, everybody's amazed and perplexed. They're bewildered by the reality that these uneducated fishermen, right, led right now in Acts chapter 2 and on for a little ways by Peter and John, a couple of fishermen, simple guys. How are they able to do this? The miraculous event that takes place. And number three, it resulted in massive repentance by those observing it. You need to take note of that. As we take a look at the idea of speaking in tongues, these are three very clear observations that we can make. Real languages, a miraculous nature, and it resulted in massive repentance. And as you study through the book of Acts, you're going to see uh, that this idea of speaking in tongues is used to spread the gospel or is proof that those who were saved were, were truly believers. And really, I'm, I'm going to talk more specifically even about that because I think that's pretty clear in, in Acts chapter 10, but we'll get there. So what we really see in, in Acts chapter 2 is it's all about the gospel, all right? Speaking in tongues is all about the spreading of the gospel. It's not about a mode of worship, all right? It's, it's not about even at some deeper level of prayer or communication with God. That's not what it is. Now, you can't dive into a passage about speaking in tongues without talking about speaking in tongues. So, so I want to take pretty much the remainder of our time and talk about that with you, okay? I, I want to preface with a couple of statements, all right? I want to preface by saying, first of all, this. There's more to say about this subject than I'm able to say in the next 15 minutes. All right? All right? I can't go to all the passages. I wish I had time to go to some more text. I can't run to all of them, all right? Unless, I mean, the bills aren't playing today, so we could be here till 6, but it's going to take a while to get through all of that. We don't, we don't have the ability to do that today. Secondly, let me say this. There are obviously those who are extreme on this subject, but there are those who are not extreme on this subject, and... We clearly have brothers and sisters in Christ who differ with us on this subject. And I think it's important for us to remember that they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? It's pretty easy to throw stones. We're, we're not here to do that today. Right? We're just here to get an understanding. But we need to remember they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thirdly, I want to say this. I do believe that God is a God of miracles. All right? God can do whatever He so chooses to do that's within His character and within what we see in the Word of God. And I do believe that God could potentially give somebody the ability to speak a known language in order to proclaim the gospel to someone. But that's not what we often see with mainstream charismatic churches when it comes to speaking in tongues. In fact, it's far from it. So please bear with me as I try to explain a, a huge topic in a few short minutes. The question we need to ask is this. How did we go from Acts chapter 2 speaking the gospel in known languages to individuals so that they can become followers of Jesus Christ to what we see in regards to speaking in tongues today in charismatic and Pentecostal churches? Because what you see in Acts 2 and what you see in mainstream charismatic churches is very, 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 very different. Well, how do we get there? Church history helps us answer this question. If you were to study church history, you would be hard-pressed to find an instance of speaking in tongues for about 1,800 years. That's a long time, all right? We go from the first century church, then we go 1,800 years to 1901. We're at a small Christian college in Topeka, Kansas, a group of individuals, a group of students gathered and they were meeting and they were studying and, and in Acts 2 and they began to ask this question, why isn't this happening today? Why isn't Acts 2 happening today? Where people are able to speak known languages in order to give the gospel to people. So they began to pray. 
And they began to pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and would really give them the ability that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, to be able to speak the gospel in other languages. And on New Year's Eve, 1901, this group was gathered, and they were praying again for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and a student named Agnes Osmond approached her professor, Charles Parham, and asked if he would lay his hands on her and pray for her to receive the gift of the Spirit. And what happens next reverberates to this very day. Charles Parham tells the story this way. He said this, I laid my hands upon her and prayed. I had scarcely completed three sentences when a glory fell upon her. A halo seemed to surround her head and her face, and she began speaking the Chinese language and was unable to speak English for three days. When she tried to write in English she, to tell us of her experience, she only wrote in Chinese. Now that sounds absolutely incredible. And if you're like me and you're a little skeptical, your first question might be, was there somebody there that knew Chinese to confirm this? Was there somebody able to speak Chinese? The answer is no. And he asked, well, how do you know the, the writing was in Chinese? And the answer is it wasn't in Chinese. And we know that because they have a piece of paper that shows the writings from that evening, and it looks like this. Now, I don't know if anybody here knows Chinese, but if you do, you know that that's not Chinese. And I'm not trying to make light of this, but we need to understand the situation. There's not one linguist who has looked at these notes over the past 100 plus years that has looked at these marks that Agnes wrote and proclaimed it to be any known language. Now, what I do appreciate about Charles Parham and about Agnes and about this group of individuals is that they truly believed that she spoke and wrote Chinese. And they stuck to the text with the beliefs that it was about preaching the gospel to people in other known languages. In fact, he goes on to say this, the Lord will give us the power of speech to talk to the people of the various nations without having to study them in schools. Their mindset was still Acts 2. Taking the gospel. He also said this, The Lord will give us the power of speech to talk to the people of various nations without having to study them in schools. A part of our labor will be to teach the church the uselessness of spending years of time preparing missionaries for work in foreign lands when all they have to do is ask God for the power. And any missionary who spent years in language school would say, I wish that was the case. He also says this, the students of Bethel College do not need to study in the old way to learn the languages. They have conferred on them miraculously. Different ones have already been able to converse with Spaniards, Italians, Bohemians, Hungarians, Germans, and French in their own language. I have no doubt various dialects of the people of India and even the language of the savages of Africa will be received during our meeting in the same way. I expect this gathering to be the greatest since the days of Pentecost. So here's what they did. They took 18 students and they sent them out to various countries including Japan, China, and India and they did not know the language. They sent them there believing that they would receive the gift of tongues and that they would be able to give the gospel to these individuals in a miraculous way. And you probably aren't surprised to know that all of them failed and came back humiliated and questioned why they couldn't speak a language. But what I do want to once again mention is I appreciate their intentionality about sticking to Acts 2. And when we think of Acts 2 and when they thought of Acts 2, they recognized this. They were real languages. They recognized that the miraculous nature of it was undeniable by most, and it resulted in massive repentance by those observing it. Their intention all along was Acts 2, was the text, was to see this happen. So how did we go from this to what we see today? Well, I think going back to exactly what we said in week one as we dove into Acts 1-1 is this. 
The book of Acts is a historical book, and it's descriptive. It's not prescriptive. You have to understand that about the book of Acts. It's critical. And it all goes back to hermeneutics and knowing how to study the text here. The problem was this. They didn't look at it at Acts as descriptive. They looked at it as prescriptive. And when it didn't happen, all of a sudden their world was rocked. And instead of saying, maybe God chooses to give some gifts and then remove them later, the charismatic and Pentecostal movement has redefined what tongues originally was 2,000 years ago. And that's where we have a problem. Earlier I mentioned the word glossa or glossolalia. Don't try to say that ten times real fast. All right, It's pretty hard. You can try that in the vehicle riding the way home. Glossolalia. Not easy. But I, I want to read to you some of the thoughts that individuals have regarding this. Okay, This, this is from a linguistics professor uh, in Toronto. He says this, There's no mystery about glossolalia tongues. Recorded samples are easy to obtain and to analyze. They always turn out to be the same thing, strings of syllables made up of sounds taken from among all those the speaker knows, put together more or less haphazardly, but which nevertheless emerge as word-like and sentence-like units because of the realistic language-like rhythm and melody. Glossolalia is indeed like language in some ways, but this is only because the speaker unconsciously wants it to be like language. Yet in spite of superficial similarities, glossolalia is fundamentally not language. All specimens of glossolalia that have ever been studied have produced no features that would even suggest that they reflect some kind of communicative system. Glossolalia is not a superficial phenomenon. In fact, anybody can produce glossolalia if he's uninhibited and if he discovers what the trick is. That, that's the problem. Okay? You just got to discover what the trick is. In fact, if you were to watch even some large churches in our nation, right, well-known churches, you, you, could, you could find some messages and you could listen to some messages that would, that would teach you how to speak in tongues as, as they describe it today. And one of the things that you'll hear, and I'm not making this up, all right, I'm not trying to belittle, but one of the things that they tell you is to make baby noises or make baby sounds and just to keep doing that repeatedly and repetitively and sooner or later, the more you practice it, the, the, the better you'll get at it. And extremes will take it as far as to say, if you can't do it, you might not be saved. In fact, I, I have a friend who was a, a youth pastor, a children's pastor, um, and, and uh, he was in a church, grew up in a church that believed this. And as he studied it and he's learned more about it, he, he's like, that's, that's not what it is. And he didn't speak in tongues like everybody else did, and so he was belittled for it. But that's not what it's talking about here at all. That's not what Acts 2 is about and the problem is, that, that what they'll tell you is this, they're non-linguistic sounds. It's a, a language of the Holy Spirit, not a human language. No, that's not Acts 2. They were known languages, and there were recipients who were there that heard the gospel in their native language. They listed them there in verses 8 through 11. The problem is, 1 Corinthians 12 1 Corinthians 14, Acts 2, 10, 19, it's the same word, languages. Or unfortunately, in most instances, it's the word tongues. Wayne Grudem, who's a theologian, he, he's a continuationist, which means he believes the gifts seen in the apostles and the early church continue today. I disagree with him, all right? But that's the position that he holds. But even he, in that position, let, I want you to hear what he says about this. He says, it should be said at the outset that the Greek word glossa, translated tongue, is not used only to mean the physical tongue in a person's mouth, but also to mean language. Even he recognizes it. In the New Testament passages where speaking in tongues is discussed, the meaning languages is certainly in view. 
It's unfortunate, therefore, that English translations have continued to use the phrase speaking in tongues, which is an expression not otherwise used in ordinary English and which gives the impression of a strange experience, something completely foreign to ordinary human life. So what he's trying to say is they're using the wrong word. I'll give you another example. The word baptize. We've talked about this many, many times. You're probably sick and tired of hearing me talk about this. But the word baptize is a terrible translation in the Bible in the New Testament. It should be the word immerse. In fact, I, I love uh, Jason when he got baptized here a couple weeks ago intentionally used the word I'm being immersed today. I love that he put that in there. He wanted to make it clear. He's following the New Testament command that he's going to be immersed. The word baptize is a terrible translation. They took a Greek word and they made it sound English. Baptizo, baptize. When really it should be translated immersed. And what Gruden is saying, even as a continuationist, he's saying the word languages, or the word tongues, should be translated in our Bible languages. But the reality is, in both of these instances, I think it comes down to the, the fact that people don't want to, oh, they don't want to stir things up, they don't want to cause division, they don't want to, no, no, give us the word that should be there. The phrase speaking in tongues sounds like you have to go through some kind of a special, uh, uh, really strange experience or something that's unusual in order to be able to speak in tongues. And no, it's just speaking in another language. He goes on. If English translations were to use the expression speaking in languages, it would not need, seem nearly as strange and would give the reader a sense much closer to what first century Greek speaking readers would have heard in the phrase when they read it in Acts or 1 Corinthians. See, when we read it, we read it with a different lens. Those first century Greek individuals, the ones who heard that in Greek, would have heard speaking in languages. That's how they would have heard it. And in both Acts and in 1 Corinthians, it's the same word. Some would say, some argue this. Well, in, in Acts 2, it is other languages. It's really clear by the text, verses 8 through 11. But after that, it's different. Speaking in tongues is not languages, it's different. I want to take you really quickly to Acts chapter 11. In Acts 10, Peter has this, this situation to be with Gentiles that come to know Christ and they have this ability to speak in other languages. And then he's coming back basically as a missionary in Acts 11 and he's reporting to the church. This is what I've been doing as a missionary. This is what's been going on. And oh, by the way, it's not just Jews that can get saved. It's Gentiles too. And he says this. As they began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. Catch that. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave us the same, gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? In other words, he's saying, listen, God gave them this ability to speak in other languages just like he gave us at the beginning. So for those that are going to say, well, Acts 2, it is languages, but after that it's different. No, it's not. That's what Peter's saying. It's just like it happened at the beginning. It was other known languages. And really, I think the reason they were able to speak in tongues in Acts 10 and Peter describes in Acts 11 is for Peter and the apostles, who were Jews, and for them to realize God used that as a proof to them it, the gospel's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles too, Peter. And it woke him up. And he changed his perspective from then on out. So, the gift of speaking in tongues was identical in Acts 10. They were speaking in real languages. It, we, we could all boil it down to this one statement. In every story of speaking in tongues in the Bible, they were real languages that the speaker did not know. But the hearer did. So I would say it's a major stretch to say that tongues in the Bible was not real languages. That it's a special spiritual gift. And by the way, even if you'd say it's a special spiritual gift, Paul makes it abundantly clear that spiritual gifts are for the edification of others. I believe if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think it's about verse 7, he makes that so obvious. Spiritual gifts are about the edification of others. Think about that. Think about spiritual gifts for, for a second, right? They're about others. If, if, God, if, you have, if you have the gift of giving, the gift of giving is not for you, is it? I mean, if it was, it'd be like, you know what, I'm going to give myself a gift today. That sounds great. I'm just going to give myself just a special gift. No. 
spiritual gift of giving is about others, isn't it? All the gifts are about others. But the way people look at spiritual, the idea of speaking in tongues today, it's about them. And it's about a, a way that they think they communicate with God. You, you need to understand, that's not how spiritual gifts are used at all. So let, let me say all this. Let, let me say one more thing. Take all the New Testament books that we have, the, 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 the books, the letters that Paul wrote. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. That's the text that people love to run to. And I don't have time to go to 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 today. But they love to run to that. First of all, 1 Corinthians was written to a church that was messed up big time. And it was a letter of correction. It was written early on in Paul's writings. Paul goes another 10 years after writing 1 Corinthians and never mentions a thing about sign gifts. Not once. In fact, if it was supposed to happen like the charismatic movement likes to see it take place today, why in the world would he have, wouldn't he have mentioned that to Timothy in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy or Titus? Certainly, he would want church leaders to know about this important mode of worship that takes place, but he never mentions it. There's a lot of other things that we could point to that I don't have time to go there. But let me reemphasize. Do I believe that God is a God of miracles? Absolutely. But I am skeptical about speaking in tongues. Am I skeptical about speaking in tongues? Absolutely I am. Because what I see in the New Testament is not what we see speaking in tongues played out in the charismatic church today. Not even close. And the more, the, the, I think a more logical and reasonable explanation of, of why don't we see it today is that God has chosen to give some gifts to the early church and later remove them. He gave some gifts to the early church and then later removed them. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 2. It says this, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first declared, uh, it, was, it was declared at first by the Lord, attested, it was attested to us by those who heard, and while God also bore witness by signs and miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. If you look at the verbs used there, they're used in the past tense. They're all past tense. And when he talks about this idea of of signs and wonders, miracles, gifts, distributed past tense. It's in the aorist tense, meaning it was a one-time kind of an event that took place there, and that was it. There's no continuation of it. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter says this, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they'll pass. As for tongues, they will cease. So I think it's much more reasonable to believe that God gave them a miraculous ability early in the book of Acts that he took away later on. I believe that the the gift of speaking in tongues was really given to the early church for this reason of the gospel. If you take a look at Acts chapter 2, that's what it's about. It's about the gospel. Nothing else. It was about people being able to hear the mighty works of God in their own language. Well, what can we take away from this today? I wanted to explain a lot of that to you, but I want you to come back to the context of Acts chapter 2 for a minute, all right? Acts chapter 2 starts off with an incredible bang, right? The church gets started, goes from 120 to 3,120. Just like that, one day. Amazing. How did that happen? Well, God gave them an incredible ability, first of all. But I do think that we could learn from some of our brothers and sisters in Christ and and not diminish the power of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit dwells with inside of us. And sometimes we think, well, I could never share the gospel with others. I can't. Yes, you can. God's Spirit resides within you dwells within you, and I think what, one of the takeaways that we can have from Acts 2 and the book of Acts in general is that we need to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about this for a minute, right? The early church here, Acts chapter 2, they were 50 days since Jesus was crucified. It would have been really easy for them to hide in that upper room and say, I know the Holy Spirit's come upon us, but time out. You see what they did to Jesus 50 days ago? I'm not going out there. 
No way, not doing it. But they didn't do it. They went out and they boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God used it in an amazing way to take the gospel and to spread it to the known world. Listen, church, we need to be bold. We need to be bold like the early church. You want to take away from, from, from Acts chapter 2 today? Be bold. Take and recognize your responsibility to take the gospel to your Jerusalem to your workplace, to your community, to your school, to your family, to your gathering later today or this week with people. Take the gospel in a bold way to your Jerusalem and see what God does with it. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says this. Let's read this together as we close. For I am not ashamed. Read it with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. I'm not ashamed. Not ashamed of the gospel. That's the power. It's that word where we get our word dynamite from again. It's the power of God for salvation. The power of the gospel is incredible. It's amazing. We just need to be bold and to share it with others who are around us. God, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. We're thankful to to be able to study how the church miraculously got started. And Lord, we ask and pray that we would recognize uh, the pattern that we see throughout Acts, the pattern of of speaking in, in languages, and this incredible ability that you gave them. But help us more than that to recognize the need to be bold with our faith and to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus this week wherever we go. Lord, help us to be intentional. Help us to live pi-squared lives, to pray, invest, and invite those who are around us to have saving, saving faith in Jesus. God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.